Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and this is my September reading wrap up so we're going to talk about all the books that I've read in September and at the end I will mention the books that I have started reading in September and almost finished but didn't so they will be discussed further in the October wrap up but I will show them and I will start out with a book which is my favorite from this month I loved everything about it I gave it five stars and I kind of regretting that I haven't read it earlier because I was talking about this book all the time and I always wanted to read it but then every time I didn't so now I finally read it and it's uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 it's a very short book you can read it in a day I read, read it I think in a week uh, I was reading it when I was commuting to the university, so on the train, and I enjoyed, like, from the first page, I was into the story. I was rooting for the main character, who is Guy Montag, and he is a fireman, and in, in this, like, dystopian world, he's not putting out fires, but he's starting fires. So he and his crew, his... Um, from, the fire, from the fire department, they are being, like, alarmed by all the people uh, in the city if someone is probably having books and they are going to the house and if they find books they will set the house on fire because books are illegal in this uh, dystopian world so that is a very interesting concept uh, i think it's quite original uh, firemen that start fires and it's also discussed in this book like how this hap how did this happen Have has it always been this way or was it different and that's uh, like questions that our protagonist in here starts to think about. And oh, you're hearing the bells from the church. Um, but he really starts to question his life and his choices and the society that he lives in. After meeting this girl that starts to ask all these difficult questions that he cannot answer. But has to reflect on it himself. We'll wait till the bells are over. <laughs> So, okay, that took uh, quite a long time, but uh, we're back. So he questions his own life and actually throughout the book, his life is kind of falling apart. He has problems with his wife. He has problems with his work. He doesn't feel um, connected with the people around him. And he, yeah, he's questioning if the way the society is going, the way they're living, if it's like the right way. And he's leaning towards, of course, uh, that it's not. There are a lot of situations that happen around him that uh, even start more of a discussion in his mind and eventually um, it's, uh, it's a choice for him if he would like to act on it or if he is going to live the way he's living. Yeah, the girl plays an important role in it but there are other characters that inspire him of course. So uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting book with a lot of interesting um, ideas in it. Uh, one of the ideas that really stood out to me, the majority like of a society decides which way the society will go. So it's not the politics exactly that is like making rules and trying to force people to be a certain way or to act a certain way. The society is, they man manipulate and the society doesn't do anything about it and kind of accepts it. And then it, it goes into worse and worse and worse. And eventually people forget how life was before all, all those things happen. So there's here one sentence that I underlined uh, about this. Uh, they talk about the captain, the captain of the fire department, who is the boss of our protagonist. And he says, but remember that the captain belongs to the most dangerous enemy to truth and freedom, the solid, unmoving kettle of the majority. So that's quite an, um, a powerful statement about how societies are built and yeah that the majority decides what what will happen in a society and another thing that he mentions is that if you want to manipulate your citizens and um to have them to accept certain rules and dictatorship you have to start early so you have to start at a children's age because they are easier to manipulate and uh, they don't remember the life before all of this so they don't know how it should be or how it was, uh, you can just start from the beginning, from their lives, take them away from the parents as soon as possible and manipulate them to trust the, the politics or your system or whatever you want to indoctrinate uh, upon them. But yeah, you want to start as early as possible. And that's also what's happening here. Uh, people give away their children like at a very early age, almost after giving birth. Uh, and they're in school the whole day and they actually not really communicating with each other or learning something interesting. They're just 
dare to spend their time and do as little as possible and even I think watch television um, <laughs> and doing as less communicating as possible. And then the last thing that I underlined that I thought was um, also an interesting concept um, he says, but you can't make people listen. They have to come around in their own time, wondering what happened and why the world blew up under them. It can't last. So it can't last the way the society is functioning, but uh, you have to wait until the majority uh, understands this and decides to act upon them. You cannot just change people's mind by itself, uh, especially when the manipulation has been going on for years and years. So. You have to wait on on the majority and in the end of the book we see how it will end of course uh for the society and uh it's a kind of an open ending so we don't know how life will progress further and what the majority will decide uh, in the end like all the societies the rest of the world uh so it's an, it's a very open ending but there are a lot of ideas in here that are that are nice to reflect upon and it's just a very suspenseful story uh i like the main character that he he's actually a villain because he's hurting people but he's doing that because of his job and then he starts to of course change as a person so we have a very nice character development and uh improvement <laughs> you might say uh, i think i'm going to reread it probably next year just to it, it's sure it's show just to see all of my notes and uh, to experience the story again i like rereading but i hardly have the time especially with longer books but i think this one uh, shouldn't be a problem to reread. And then I was still in this dystopian and um, critique on the society kind of vibe. So I also read Animal Farm. This is also a book that I wanted to read for a long time. And I actually started reading it, but then stopped at like page 40 a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, now I read it from the beginning until the end. And I gave this one four stars. It, it was not as good as um, Fahrenheit. But I did enjoy it. And this story is not like a dystopian story, I think. It's not talking about the future per se. It, it could happen at any time, but, or it couldn't happen. But it's more like um, a critique on revolution and again on societies. And as I understand, George Orwell was inspired by the Russian Revolution when he was writing this one. And it, it is about the Russian Revolution, only we're like in an animal farm. And uh, it's a revolution of animals against uh, the owner of the farm, a human, and actually at the, uh, at the end against all like humans. And uh, the inspiration was the Russian revolution. However, you can fit this one to any kind of revolution and it still be kind of accurate, I think. I think the essence of the story is that a revolution is started because people are oppressed, of course, but also because they feel like, well, we can change now something. This is the moment and we're not living the best of our lives, we are oppressed, we want to do something and we're going to seize this moment and do something about it. And then, of course, someone has to take the leading role. Someone has to be the leader of the, this new society, of this new movement. Um, and there is an end of the old society, uh, of the old paradigm. So there's just new ideas that are brought up, new uh, ideologies <laughs> that have to build this new society. So the animals in the story, they start out with exiling the owner of the farm, Mr. Jones. Um, he's, he got scared, he ran away and they now have the farm, uh, which is great, of course, but someone should take the lead in it. So we have the pigs, they are smarter than the older animals and they take the lead and start to build up this like animalism they call it the animal society and the animal ideology and humans are bad and this farm is for them but they also want to inspire other farms around them to start this revolution as well so uh, they have all these ideas they have this their fight song like the song of that society that they sing every day and they raise their own flag and everything and they feel like really proud about their achievements and then we realize that not a lot has changed. Uh, still the animals have less and less to eat. Like the first uh, months everything is fine and they're still in this hype of yeah we have our, our own rules, our own uh, farm, it's all going well. But then the winter comes, things get harder, they have all of the things that they have to do to keep surviving. And some of the animals, like the, the pigs for example, they are living still better than the older animals. They choose to isolate this, themselves from the older animals and feel more powerful, feel more 
uh, entitled to certain things, to certain food items or to certain housing. So throughout the book, we see that the society is also falling apart. But the essence is that the, especially the newer animals, like the, 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 the children animals, they don't know how life was before. So they're accepting this new form of life and they're thinking that this is better than it was before because they hear all of those horrible tales about how life was with Mr. Jones, how he would oppress them and beat them and they would be hungry and they are scared of Mr. Jones coming back and certainly nothing could be worse than that, right? So they're accepting their new way of life because they don't want Mr. Jones to return. And that kind of uh, argument takes away the power to discuss the problems in their current society because if they try to discuss the, uh, the, the, um, the problems they would hear like well uh, it's now better so why are you complaining you don't want Mr. Jones to come back right and of course they can only say yes we don't want that so there's no other choice so very interesting I would uh, recommend this one as well to anyone and I really like those kind of dystopian and criticism novels about society, about the world and ideology, maybe because I'm also like in philosophy in general and <laughs> just like reflecting on how we uh, think about things and how we accept ideologies or certain rules and especially how society functions. I find that very interesting, like who decides uh, and how do we progress? And I'm hoping to reread both of them next year, uh, especially because I was reading this one on the train as well and I didn't make any notes actually. Um, so I would like to reread it and see certain things that I found interesting um, to reflect more upon it. Then a book that I also want to reread, <laughs> I don't know when, but I think this is a book that I cannot read only once and then just put it away. Some books are like that, uh, you just read it for a story, it's nice and you put them away and it's fine. But this one, I think I have to reread it multiple times to really um, get the essence out of it. And it's Orlando by Virginia Woolf. I have never read another book by Virginia Woolf. Um, in the beginning I really had to get used to her writing style, it's very poetic and uh, she makes very long sentences. She describes the surrounding a lot and I feel like some of the story and like story details are somewhere in those lines and maybe I missed some of the details when I was focusing on her writing like on, on the bigger picture about the environment and not on the details that she was trying to say. It's kind of a difficult book to read but there are like a lot of fascinating moments in here. So we start out with Orlando, a young boy who is rich, he is family of the queen Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we shot out with Queen Elizabeth. It was somewhere around 1500. And I have to say, I don't know much about like the history of England. So that was also insightful because this is kind of a historical fiction novel as well. Um, but he is living in the castle of Queen Elizabeth, and he's just this rich and entitled and kind of an um, uh, I, I think a horrible person to read about. Uh, he is, of course, it, it was it was a different time, but he is not very nice. There's of course horrible racism going on, and he's very pretentious about himself. Uh, he comes to an age where he has to marry uh, a girl, and um, he has all those marriage proposals. But every woman is not good enough. The one is stupid. The other one is not uh, pretty enough. And then there's this Russian girl that he falls in love with, but eventually she stoots him up and uh, disappears. So he's mad about that. And I really didn't like his male form in this uh, novel because uh, eventually he changes into a woman. And this happens very uh, sudden. <laughs> so uh, all of a sudden he's a woman and his entire character also changes. He really grows up and changes towards another person. Uh, so that was a, an interesting concept that I have not, not read before. Uh, so I didn't like his character in the beginning and then all of a sudden he was someone else. He was a woman, he had certain older ideas now, uh, he felt more grown up and even more considerate about his environment. And then there are these other changes. Towards the end, uh, she, now Orlando is a she, and she feels like a little bit demented. Uh, the time is just flying by. We are now, now in like in 1800s. Things are happening around her, but she cannot grasp the changes anymore in the society. She just lives on, it's like a, it's like a vampire story. She lives forever, 
Uh, she sees all things change around her, but she's not present in the time anymore. Everything just flies by and a lot of the um, dialogue in here is with herself about the memories from the past and she's living in like multiple time lapses, <laughs> time settings uh, at the same time. <laughs> so that was very difficult to read and uh, I, I had to reread some passages like a couple of times to see like where we at in, in the time frame and also what she's talking about. Um, there are a lot of things that I already underlined so I kind of looking forward to go back into this book and see what my ideas were in, were in the beginning and then the end. And this is the kind of book that you start out with a certain character and a certain uh, setting in a story and then you end somewhere entirely different with a different character in a different setting. For me that was like a very original concept um, and also I have read a little bit about Virginia Woolf and understand that she was a pioneer in like this uh, stream of consciousness dialogue where we are like in the mind of the character and also she, the character is just talking on and on in his mind or her mind about the things around uh, the environment and you have this like never ending sentences that are difficult to pinpoint to an exactly um, subject <laughs> or team so it's all around the place and it's uh, one team after another. So at some point I, I liked his description of uh, the, here he was still a male and he was living like a diplomat in Turkey and he um, describes here a certain time waste of like uh, bureaucracy and also the, like the rich people and their rituals that actually have nothing productive but they still do it because they have power and they're important persons so they have these rituals all about them. Uh, for example, that he's like a diplomat and he has to visit other diplomats and of ambassadors, ambassadors. And there are like all of these doors that he has to pass and all of this small talk that he has to do uh, before he arrives with the ambassador and he cannot discuss any political or actually important stuff with the ambassador, <laughs> but only the weather or something. He says here it was only permissible to compare Con Constantinople as a place of residence with London. And the ambassador naturally said that he preferred Constantinople and his host naturally said, though they had not seen it, that they preferred London. So they both lied and um, they had to like give the, uh, give the other person the idea that they respect or like the city of that, that other person. And they had to do that every time that they meet, even though this doesn't add any productivity or meaning whatsoever. So that was <laughs> quite funny. And then the last book that I actually read and finished is a classic. It's uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. And this one was yeah, also a book that I wanted to read a long time because I wanted to read all of the gothic classics. The language in here is, is difficult. Again, I had to get used to the writing style of uh, Robert Stevenson. And I had to look up a lot of words in here. But um, I enjoyed it. I gave it 4 out of 5. Obviously this book is a classic for a reason. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> and it talks about the good and the evil in a person. And usually the idea is that we have uh, a good and a bad side inside of us. And they're hopefully in balance. And we kind of choose to um, make the right decisions. But we all have like a bad side in us. And this story explores the possibility of someone only having an evil side. A bad side and um, how that would look, how the person would think and how others will uh, react to, to a certain person. So we have uh, Mr. Hyde and um, every time he's introduced into the story or someone meets him, they just really don't like him and they cannot explain why, but there's something wrong with him. There's something wrong with his face, there's something wrong with his behavior. And even though they can't explain it, they all feel it. And then there is Mr. Jekyll, which, who is a very respectable character and everyone likes him and he's smart and rich. And yeah, the, those two characters are like heaven and hell. Uh, they're very different from each other, but of course they're one person. If you're familiar with the story, I think it's like, uh, it's not a spoiler, but we all know that it's one person, Mr. Jekyll and uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And towards the end of the book, uh, it's more about the choices of Mr. Jekyll and why it was easier to choose evil or why it was so um, addictive to be evil 
uh, compared to being a good person. So I found this one uh, quite exciting to read, even though the language was sometimes a little bit old and I had to look up a lot of words, but I, I really love the story and I'm glad that I read this classic. <laughs> and then the last book that I want to discuss is uh, The Fall of the House of Usher and all the writings. I haven't read the entire book, but I have read The Fall of the House of Usher because the Netflix adaptation is coming out and I wanted to experience the story myself first before watching the show. And I have also yesterday read the um, Telltale Heart, <laughs> the Telltale Heart, and I, I like both of the stories, but the Telltale Heart, I read it for the second time now, I read it first a couple of years ago, and now yesterday I decided to reread it again, it's very short, like five pages or so. I kind of noticed that rereading uh, Bo's work really works for me. <laughs> Uh, because the first time that I read his stories, I don't always understand it. Like for example, now I've read The Fall of the House of Usher, but I still feel like I haven't understand all the details. So I would like to reread that one also. And another story that I have read a couple of years ago was The Cask of Amontillado. Uh, most of his stories you can find for free online because it's quite an old, uh, of course, uh, work. Um, so the Cask of Montiado I just read on a website online and I know I had a lot of trouble to understand the story like um, I think because his horror elements and like the suspenseful stuff that is happening in the story is uh, hidden in the lines it's sometimes it's difficult to understand what is going on but then I watched uh, a video by um, the channel Better Than Food about the story of the Cosco of Montiado and then everything fell into place. And I noticed that I have this a lot with both stories. I think I'm going to reread The Fall of the House of Usher again, maybe today or tomorrow, to see if I understand it better. But uh, the Telltale Heart in here, I love it. It's a, a really good story, so I would recommend that one. And then the books that I have started reading in September, but I uh, haven't finished them. And obviously I'm going to discuss them in my October wrap-up, so I'm not going to go into details, but I will just mention them. Uh, Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. This one I'm also reading on the train now, um, but it's a, it's a gothic novel about like the irony, I think, of reading gothic novels. <laughs> so we're following Catherine, who is uh, into reading uh, horror and like ghost stories and she has this friend that she discusses these things with and for now it's like a coming of age story of Catherine and her introduction into the society but uh, it's funny it's interesting then I started reading Holly by Stephen King his newer book I think I'm going to make a review about this one I have a lot of things to say it's a it's so far it's an interesting story but there are some things that I don't like about this book so I'm going to discuss it further but yeah it, it is a very beautiful cover though and then the last book is uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I always wanted to read this one completely. I have read fragments <laughs> in my lifetime. I love the fairy tale. Uh, I have seen like the Disney adaptation a hundred times, but I wanted to read the entire story. And I had the hope to finish this story in September, but I started uh, reading it yesterday the, the, on the 30th of September. Um, and I didn't finish it in one day, <laughs> so it's going to be in my October wrap-up. I read half of the book, so now only like 40 pages are left. Yeah, and so far this is it. Thank you for watching and let me know what is your favorite book of September and I will see you next time. Goodbye!